All righty, ladies and gentlemen, it's final exam time. Let's see if we can get through this whole semester in about 10 or 15 minutes. So we're going to start off our first unit. We did some algebra review. Let's do some exponent rules. First thing, this is a square root. So you can think of it as a square root, but I'm going to use the exponent rules and say everything here has to go to the one half power. So 64 to the one half. Six times one half is three and eight times one half is four. So that's my numerator. 8 to the 1 third, a to the 3 times 1 third is 1, and 6 times 1 third is 2. I got some work to do. I can simplify that quite a bit. So first thing, 64 to the 1 half, again, that's the square root. The square root of 64 is 8. I still have a cubed, I still have b to the fourth, and the cube root of 8 is 2, a, b squared. Now I can go ahead and write this as a fraction. So simplify that, 8 divided by 2 is 4. A cubed divided by A is A squared, and B to the fourth divided by B squared is B squared. You're just canceling out a couple of them, but that's what's left. Pretty much the same game here. I'm going to do 2 times 1 half and 3 times 1 half. That's a messy problem. 3 times 1 third is X. One uh, 3 times 1 third is 1, so X and Y. Now I can combine like terms. 1 plus 1 is 2. And then here, if you're going to add fractions, you need a common denominator. So how many halves are in one whole? That'd be two halves. Three halves plus two halves make five halves. So x squared, y to the five halves. Simplifying radicals, I like to completely factor this. So if you want to make a factor tree, you can. I can probably do it in my head. It's 2 times 48, which is 2 times 24, which is 2 times 12, which is 2 times 6, which is 2 times 3. So that's 96. And I'll do the, the uh, variables in my head. Okay. The reason that helps is because we're finding a fifth root. So you're looking for groups of five. One, two, three, four. Hey, look at that. Two to the fifth. X to the fifth. So for every five twos underneath, one makes it out. For every five X's underneath, one makes it out. What's trapped still in there? You still got a three and you still got those three Y's. So three Y cubed is trapped on the inside. Pretty much the same game here. Wait a minute. Hang on, maybe not. The fourth root of something to the fourth power is just the radicand, 562. Okay, these roots and uh, powers against the other radicals. Kind of tricky. You don't need to factor anything. Okay, sum and difference of cubes. When you're factoring, always look for GCF first. Yeah, that's 27. 8x cubed plus 27. First thing, do that. Then you need to remember sum of cubes. The formula is AB, A squared, a, B, B squared, and the way you remember the signs is SOAP. So this is positive, same, opposite, always positive. So what's the cube root of X cubed? That'd be X, cube root of 27 is 3, A squared is X squared, their product is 3X, and B squared is 9. You still have the 8 out front, same, opposite, always positive. Sum and difference of cubes. This next one's a little messier. We got some quantities. So what do these two terms both have? They both have a 5x cubed. And how many x minus 3s? They both have two of those. Okay. So what's left on the inside? Sometimes brackets help to separate these. Uh, I need an x minus 3. And I need a, just a 1. Okay. So there's the numerator. I'm not going to do anything with the denominator just yet. So in the denominator, I'm still going to have, at, well, that's not a line, x minus 3 to the fifth. Okay, so I can do a couple things. I'm going to work over here. First thing, I can cancel out two of these, so now that's a 3. Okay, so if you have 2 in the top and 5 in the bottom, two of them cancel out. You still have 3 in the bottom. But that simplifies to x minus 4. So I have 5x cubed, x minus 4 over, I still have three of those x minus threes in the denominator. So that is my simplified version. I don't think I can do any more than that. Last one, you've got some negative exponents and you've got some other things. So first look at four and eight. I can factor out a four. What else can I factor out? X squared minus two, x squared minus two. So anytime you see a negative exponent, that's what you want to factor out. X squared minus two to the negative one half. I also have some two x squareds minus five I can factor out. This guy has three of them. This guy has two, so I can factor out two of them. Okay, so let's see what that does for me. 
I have factored out the 4, I have factored out that, I have factored out 2 of them. I still have a 2x squared, let me do that in a different color, 2x squared minus 5 to the first, which you don't really need the parentheses, but sometimes it helps to see them. Plus, 4 times 2 is 8, and then this is the tricky part. So we're essentially dividing, and when you divide exponents, you subtract. So 1 half minus negative 1 half is positive 1, that's to the first. And I have both of my 2x squared minus 5, so I'm good. I just need to combine like terms. So this is all going to stay the same. Let's simplify the inside. 2x squared minus 5 plus 2x squared minus 4. 4x squared minus 9. Hey, that's factorable. That's the difference of squares. 2x plus 3, 2x minus 3. And I still have, this thing has been out front the whole time. I just haven't been writing it, so that's my beginning. That is now... Completely factored. Whoa, I'll leave that four there. Okay, that's not completely factored. The only thing you might do when you rewrite this is you could write this in the denominator. It is a multiple choice test, so just keep that in mind. Cool, moving right along. Solve the nonlinear inequality. Okay, so first thing we want to do is get everything on one side. 5x squared plus 5x minus 30 is greater than or equal to zero. Then we can factor to find some critical points. x squared plus x minus 6. Then we can factor that. That will be x plus 3x minus 2, which means now we have points at negative 3 and positive 2. If I plug negative 3 into the left side, I will get 30. If I plug 2 into the right side, I will get 30. But this is an inequality, so I need to make a sign chart. So I'll put negative 3 and positive 2 on here. Those both make true statements, so they are closed circles. And now let's pick a small number, like negative 10. I plug negative 10 here, I get a negative. If I plug negative 10 in here, I get a negative. A positive times a negative times a negative is a positive. Let's try zero. Positive, positive, negative. That's a negative. Big number, 10. Positive, 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 positive. So the interval that I want is the positive interval because I'm looking for numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. So the way we write this in interval notation is negative infinity to negative 3 union 2 to infinity. All right, other way you can do that is graph it. If you graph this, you could be able to see it on the graph pretty easily, so that's cool. Find the domain, so the two big things you're looking for, you cannot square root a negative, so x has to be greater than or equal to zero. You can also not divide by zero, so if you factor the denominator, that'd be plus one, minus one, one half and negative one. So the denominator cannot, you cannot plug in one half or negative one because then you divide by zero. So let's now draw another number line to help. The numbers that are, that are important here are negative 1, uh, 0, and 1 half. So the first thing that has to be true is you have to pick numbers greater than or equal to 0. So this way, but you cannot plug in 1 half. It doesn't even matter that it can't be negative 1 because it has to be greater than or equal to 0. So in interval notation, 0 to 1 half, union, 1 half to infinity. Evaluate the difference quotient. Okay, so this is just a little bit of work. That means I'm going to plug in a plus h for x. I'm also going to plug in a for x, and then I'm going to simplify. So a plus h squared plus 1, that's f of a plus h. Minus, if I plug in a, a squared plus 1, and it's all over h. Now it's just a matter of simplifying. The way that people miss this most often is they try and distribute exponents. That is no good. You cannot distribute exponents. you got to FOIL. a squared plus 2ah plus h squared. Write it out. a plus h, a plus h. a squared, ah, ah, that makes 2ah plus h squared. Okay, do not try and distribute exponents ever. Minus a squared. The other spot people miss it is you're subtracting a quantity. So make sure you distribute the negative, minus a squared, minus 1. We should have some stuff cancel out here. What cancels out? a squared. Wait, I missed, I didn't copy my plus 1. There's that plus 1 there too. So there's a plus 1 in there that's going to cancel out as well. So what's left? I have 2ah plus h squared over h, and then I can factor an h out of the numerator, 2a plus h. And now I can cancel that out. So the final answer is 2a plus h. Cool. 
Inverse. So to find the inverse, you got to flip X and Y. This is my output, so now it's X. And those X's are now Y's. So first thing I'll do is multiply both sides by the denominator, and I'm going to distribute 2XY equals 1 plus 3Y. Next, I want to get all my Y's on one side. I'm also going to subtract 1. So I'm doing a couple things at once here. Subtract 1 and add that, 2XY plus 3Y. Now I can factor out a y, 2x plus 3. And the last step to get the y by itself is you will divide both sides by 2x plus 3. So there's your inverse. Okay, you can write it y equals, or you might also see it f inverse, 5x minus 1 over 2x plus 5. Cool. Same game here. x equals the cube root of y minus 1. Move the 2 over. To undo a cube root, you're going to cube both sides. So x minus 2 cubed equals y minus 1. Add 1. Again, you might write it as an inverse. So f inverse is, if I add 1 to both sides, I get x minus 2 cubed plus 1. Only it's g in this function, so let's make it g inverse. There you go. See? It's g. Cool. We are moving. All right, f of g of x. f of g of x means you're going to take g of x and you're going to plug it in everywhere you see an x. So something 2x plus 3, the something here is 4x minus 1. Distribute 8x minus 2. Now you get 8x plus 1. Go the other way. So now if I want to plug f into g, instead of 4x minus 1, it's 4 times something minus 1. Here the something is 2x plus 3. 8x plus 12 minus 1 is 8x plus 11. Okay, 8x plus 1 plus 11, that's kind of cool. It looks similar. All right, so we're in unit two. We still got some stuff to do. We got discontinuities. Okay, discontinuities are basically we're looking for holes in the graph or vertical asymptotes. So the first thing you want to do is you want to factor the denominator. The numbers that multiply to 10 and add to 7 are x plus 5 and x plus 2. So that means... Since those cancel out, you have at x equals negative 5 what's called a removable discontinuity. In the graph, that will show up as a hole in the graph. You might not even notice it unless you're paying real close attention. But we will also have at x equals negative 2 an infinite discontinuity. Discontinuity. Continuity, discontinuity. An infinite discontinuity in this case is going to show up as a vertical asymptote. Do I have that graphed? No, I don't have that graphed. Okay. So we have a removable discontinuity at x equals negative 5. That gets canceled out so you see it as a hole in the graph. But you have an infinite discontinuity at x equals negative 2. That is a vertical asymptote. Okay, one to one means each output has one input. The input of the inverse is the output of the original function. So that means I can set negative 18 equal to 9 minus 3x and solve. So subtract 9, divide both sides by negative 3, and you get x equals 9. If you plug 9 into this, you will get negative 18, which means if you plug negative 18 into the inverse, you will get positive 9. You flip x and y. Describe the end behavior. So now we're in polynomials. So you probably don't need to actually graph these, but if you've got your graphing calculator, you can. I'm just going to sketch them how I know they look because I really don't need to graph the whole thing, uh, but I am going to have to write some end behavior. So maybe I'll type that up. Maybe that'll be easier. Let's see if I do this. F of X goes to something as X. Let's do this. As X goes to something. I'm going to need a bunch of these. So there's two. Okay. You know what? I can I can make this work. This is going to be faster in the long run. Okay, so give me two of these. Grouping, yes, yes, yes. All right, that'll save me some effort here in a sec. Now, let's actually do the problems. Okay, first thing. Since this function has a positive leading coefficient and is even, then I know both ends go up. I like to draw it as a W, which means the Y's the f of x's are both going to positive infinity, 
as you go to the right, so as x goes to positive infinity, and as you go to the left. x goes to infinity means you're going right. y goes to infinity means up. So up and right, and this means up and left, up and left. Up and right, up and left. That's how we're describing it. This is negative and even, so it's an m. It might be an m. It might not have that many turnarounds. But that means that y is going to negative infinity on both ends as x goes to infinity and as x goes to negative infinity. This is negative and odd, so it's going to look something like that. As you go to the right, it goes down, so negative infinity. And as you go to the left, it goes up. Left and up, up, left, same thing. Down, right, down, right. This is positive and odd, so it looks like that. As you go to the right, y goes up. As you go to the left, y goes down. Okay. Cool. Next up, find all zeros. So if this is easily factorable, you can just go ahead and start factoring. But I don't think this is easily factorable. I think I'm going to need to find some zeros to start. So graph it. Where can I start? Is that this one? Yes. Good, good. So these are all the zeros. Now, on a multiple choice test, you might just be able to work backwards. But I'm going to go through this the long way. I know negative 2 and positive 5 are zeros. So I'm going to do some synthetic division with negative 2. 1, negative 5, negative 5, 23, 10. So I'm going to do synthetic division, 14, 9, negative 18, 5, and I get 0. Cool. That knocks it down to a cubic. Now I'm going to do it again with positive 5, but I'm going to use the cubic. I hate how it's not horizontal like that. I'm going to use the cubic coefficients, 1, negative 7, 9, and 5. And I should still get 0. Negative 5, 0. But now I have a quadratic. x squared minus 2x minus 1. And I need to know when that equals 0 with exact answers. So I need to do the quadratic formula. 2 plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a. 2 plus or minus, that's 4, plus 4 is 8. That's 2 radical 2. So 1 plus or minus 1 radical 2. That's two of my zeros. The other ones are negative 2. And the, the last one is positive 5. So I can check that. If I go back to my graph, if I type in 1 plus radical 2, 1 plus radical 2, I get 2.41. Is that 2.41? Yep, 2.414. Cool. So I know I did it right. Okay. So finding all your zeros, you're able to work backwards. You can just type it in your calculator and get the decimal version on a multiple choice test, but that's how you do it if you don't have a calculator. Determine, hey, we got a bell. If x minus four is a factor, another way of saying that is test to see if four is a zero. So I'm gonna do synthetic division, six, negative 26, and 12, and I get uh, four. No, x minus four is not a factor because this would have to be a zero. It is not a zero, so that means x minus four is not a factor. Simplify rational. So the name of the game is can you factor? So let's factor the numerator. If I factor the numerator, y minus 6, y plus 3. If I factor the denominator, uh, I need 3 and 2, so plus 1, plus 3. Does anything cancel? No. That's what simplifies is going to get. It doesn't simplify. So it's kind of lame. Okay. Let's look at this next one. This one's tricky because so, you need to get a common denominator. So 1 over x squared, and here I have x, x plus 1. So what can I multiply these guys so that they both have the same denominator? He needs, he's got an x, but he needs an x plus 1 in the top and bottom. This guy's got an x, but he needs another x, so he needs an x. So I'll square him, and now he's got an x in the top. Now everything is over x squared, x plus 1. What's in the top? x plus 1 plus x. So I can simplify that. x plus x is 2x plus 1 over x squared x plus 1. That's all you can do. You can't simplify these out. You can't cross out the 1s or cancel out an x. These are connected by addition, and division un undoes multiplication, not addition. So you can't do anything else. Solve the equation. Again, get a common denominator. So this guy needs an x plus 9. This guy needs an x. So they have the same denominator. This guy needs both. Now, 
since they all have the same denominator, you can multiply both sides by x times x plus 9. If you do that, then all these denominators cancel out. Okay, so you're only focusing on the numerator now. So the whole goal is to get a common denominator and then you just ignore their denominator. 10x plus 90 plus 98x equals 9x squared plus 81x. I need to get everything on one side. I'm going to need more space. So to get everything on one side, I'm going to have 9x squared. This is 108x, 81 minus 108x is negative 27x. And then I move the 90 over, minus 90 equals 0. This looks scary, but just factor out a 9 and it's easy. Okay, now I can do factoring x minus 5, x plus 2. When do this equal 0? When x equals 5 and x equals negative 2. Or do they? Are those? Okay, that's fine. Uh, if you plug in 5, you don't get 0. If you plug in negative 2, you don't get 0. You need to check to see if those are not in the domain. So make sure you go back and check your answers. You can plug them in. It can also work backwards, obviously. Here, we're going to cross multiply. 5 times 4x minus 2 equals 8 times x plus 2. So 20x minus 10 equals 8x plus 16. Subtract 8x, add 10, gross. 26 over 12 is 13 over 6, which is 2.16 repeating or something. You can use your calculator if it's a decimal. X-intercepts, Y-intercept, and asymptotes. So, again, I'm going to kind of type this up. X-intercepts, Y-intercept, vertical, and then I'll say horizontal or slant because it depends on the problem. So I'm going to need both of these. Let me get more space. Okay. All right. So to find the X-intercepts, you need to figure out where the numerator is equal to zero. So I will uh, factor the numerator, which I can do 2X squared plus 5x minus 6, x plus 6, x minus 1. So the x-intercepts are negative 6, 0, and 1, 0. The first thing you got to do, factor the numerator. Those are your x-intercepts. To find the y-intercept, you plug in 0. So all this cancels out. Negative 12 divided by negative 6 is 2. 0, 2 is the y-intercept. To find the vertical asymptotes, you figure out where the denominator equals 0. So I need to factor the denominator. That would be x plus 3, x minus 2. So there are vertical asymptotes at negative 3 and positive 2. And lastly, another bell. To find the horizontal asymptotes or the slant asymptote, you look at the degree. These have the same degree, so you divide the leading coefficients. The horizontal asymptote is y equals 2. We're going to play the same game over here. X-intercepts are when you have, let's see, x minus 4, x minus Plus two. So there are x-intercepts at 4, 0, and negative 2, 0. The y-intercept, if you try and plug in 0, then you're dividing by 0. That's not good. There is no y-intercept in this graph. It doesn't hit the y-axis as a as vertical asymptote, which means I could say the vertical asymptote is x equals 0. And lastly, since this numerator has a higher degree, you need to do long division to find the slant asymptote, x squared minus 2x minus 8. So to do long division, you figure out what x gets multiplied by to get x squared, x squared, and then you have 0x. Flip your signs, negative 2x minus 8. Do it again. x times negative 2 is negative 2x. This doesn't really matter. The remainder is negative 8, but nobody cares. The slant asymptote is x minus 2. You can graph it to kind of verify that. Uh, you can see that it, the end behavior approaches x minus 2 if you zoom out on it. But again, that's how you do it algebraically. We're cruising. Last unit, unit five logs. So first thing I'm gonna do is put these exponents back in. One of the rules of logs is leading coefficients can go inside the log. Or you can go the other way and bring them out as exponents. So this is the log of x to the fourth minus the log of one third is a cube root. I'm just gonna write it as cube root plus the log of x minus one squared. But now I'm going to do the addition first, and then I know I have minus sign, which is going to be division. So I'm going to write this as the log of x to the fourth, x minus one squared, and I'm going to divide by, since you're subtracting, 
the cube root of x squared plus 1. It's not pretty, but you have one log now. Okay, so it's important that you guys realize when you're subtracting, that's going to be in the denominator, and this stuff's all going to be in the numerator. Um, addition condenses into multiplication, and division condenses into, or subtraction condenses into division. Let's go the other way. First, separate the fraction, b to the fourth radical c. Division expands into subtraction. So you see that fraction bar? That means we're subtracting. But I can do more. I can bring the 2 out. And I can bring this, well, let's do two things. Log b to the fourth plus log square root of c. You got to be careful here because you're subtracting a quantity. This is going to be 2 log a. Since these are both in a denominator, they're both going to be negative. So minus the 4 can come out, log b. And it's also minus here. This is 1 half, so 1 half log c. That's a one-half exponent squared is one-half, so I can bring that out. That's completely expanded. To solve, you have a base e exponent, so take a base e log. That's called the natural log. If you take the natural log of both sides. On the left side, you just get, so the x plus 2 can come out, and the natural log of e is 1, so that's x plus 2. On the right side, you still have the natural log of 10. So if you subtract 2, negative 2 plus the natural log of 10, and then you can use your calculator. Let's see if I can get my calculator going. Uh, calculator right here. So I'm going to do negative 2 plus the natural log of 10. And I get 0 0.3026, usually four decimals. X equals 0 0.3026. And you can store that and you can work backwards. This is a good trick. If you store that as A, now I'll go E to the A plus 2, especially on a multiple choice test. Delete that. Store it in your calculator using the store button and then type it back in. Do you get 10? Yeah, we got 10. I mean, I know I did it right. Okay, I have all the decimals here and I checked it. Here you have a log, so let's rewrite it as an exponent. 2 cubed equals 25 minus x. That's 8. I'm going to add x and I'm going to subtract 8. x equals 17. Here I'm going to take the base 3 log of both sides because I have a base 3 exponent. And now on the left side, I just have x plus 3, but on the right side, I have the base 3 log of 5. So x equals negative 3 plus the base 3 log of 5. Negative 3 plus the base 3 log of 5 is negative 1.535. Negative 1.535. x equals negative 1.535. Again, you can check that. Store it as A, and then type it in. 3 to the A plus 3B5. Yes, we did it right. Last thing, we got a little modeling problem here. So if it's PE to the RT, P is the initial investment, 1,000 E. The interest rates, so we're doing this continuously. You just need to write that as a decimal, 0 0.09, and T is the number of years. So that's the balance over time. Now, if it says, when will you have $2,500, you want to say the balance is $2,500. So $2,500 equals $1,000 e to the point, oh, hang on, 0 0.09t. Isolate the exponent, so divide by 1,000. Uh, 25 over 10 is 5 halves. Now I can undo a base e exponent by doing the natural log, so that's 2.5 equals 0.09t, and then I can now divide out the 0.09. So the natural log of 2.5 over 0.09 is 10.18, 10.18. So a little more than 10 years. In a little more than 10 years, you will have $2,500 in your bank account. Is that it? We're done? Wow. All right. So that is an entire semester. And how long did it take us? Just under a half hour. Good luck on your finals. If you can do this, you should be in pretty good shape.